Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rabbi Patrick Olive, and I'm very excited to have you here at um, One Shul. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. We don't have a Siddur for uh, today's service. We're doing a mostly video-oriented service. If this is your first time to One Shul, we are an online Jewish community, and we are pluralistic. Now, what that means is that we have different types of community members from all over the world. We use different types of Siddurim uh, prayer books, depending on who's leading. We have all kinds of different classes taught by a whole range of perspectives uh, on Judaism. And wherever you are in your Jewish journey, uh, we are there with you. Um, we, of course, are a nonprofit organization. We do rely on small donations. We're not part of a bigger nonprofit. Um, so we do rely on your help. We suggest a $10 donation for every service or class that you attend. This helps us to run the website. Just streaming alone costs about $150 a month. Uh, for us to use our chat room, that costs us about $20 a month. And then, of course, running our actual website. All the little fun software, gizmos and gadgets uh, cost money as well. So you can do that by uh, donating to the top... Um, little button right there. You can use PayPal. You can also use um, a debit card or a credit card as well. We're going to kick things off with Shiro Ladonai. Uh, this is a video from Zamru, which is an independent uh, minion in Princeton, New Jersey. They have a beautiful music-oriented uh, minion, and this video is something that they made to promote their minion. I'm excited we get to use it here. So here we begin with Zamru's variation on Shiro Ladonai.
wonderful community up there and terrific variation on Shiru Ladona, very Karl Bach oriented. We're going to do something a little bit different now. This is La Chadoudi. It's done by an acapella group called the Maccabees. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful song by the Maccabees. Now, normally after doing these introductory songs of Kabbalat Shabbat, we would then transition into our Mariv service. In traditional communities and in conservative communities, this is typically a time where you have the Devar Torah, the teaching of the Torah and the weekly Torah portion. Now, we are, we have left Simchat Torah. I sort of feel like it drags on into Shabbat. The revelry of Simchat Torah should at least go into Shabbat. I know it is for me tonight. Um, but we also go to the beginning of our Torah. We go to the beginning with Bereshit, with the first book of the Torah, Genesis, in the beginning. So I was thinking about what kind of Devar I wanted to give and what I wanted to talk about specifically, and I wanted to do something a little different. We are a different community, uh, and we have this wonderful video technology that we really should embrace. I would be curious to know, just looking at the chat room, how many people are familiar with our Darshan Yeshiva? And if you're not familiar with it, all you have to do is scroll down and look at the, uh, the bottom of the screen there, and you'll actually see an advertisement for it. But uh, we've opened this really terrific online school called the Darshan Yeshiva. 
It's an online school training lay Jewish spiritual leaders. Um, we also, in addition to our ordination program, our ordaining of Darshanim, um, we also have an intro to Judaism course, which is great for people who are interested in converting, uh, people who want to learn more about Judaism. Maybe they didn't get a particularly Jewish uh, upbringing or Jewish education. I know a lot of us, and I know myself especially, learn Judaism online, right? We, we learn online, we get books, but we don't take classes, right? That's not something we necessarily do. Some people do, but I know a lot of people in our online community really just do their online learning, and that's it. And it's a very disconnected experience. So what we wanted to offer with Darshan Yeshiva is an opportunity not only to learn in a very structured way, uh, because sometimes when you learn, you only learn the things you want to learn, right? And so you miss out on certain things. You know, there's a lot of things that get missed about Judaism by not learning Hebrew. There's a lot of things that get missed in Judaism by not learning Jewish history. Um, a lot of people I know go from learning nothing about Judaism to Kabbalah, right? It's a straight line. Or um, a lot of people I know have gone from uh, growing up in non-religious backgrounds to immediately wanting to be rabbis, right? It's a very, they want that very quick process. And you can study on your own, and you can kind of create your own curricula. The problem, though, is you need to know what you don't know. I'm going to say that one more time. You need to know what you don't know. And that's what we're here to do at Darshan Yeshiva. We're here to help people to find those areas where maybe they need to strengthen a little bit. And it can go two ways. Either you can join as uh, an ordination student and you can later be ordained uh, as a Darshan. The other option is to do the Intro to Judaism course. Now we have more uh, programs that are going to open up. These are the two that we're launching with right now. I have all kinds of beautiful dreams and visions of where we're going to go uh, in the future. But we'd love to have you get involved. So, in a sense, this is a beginning. This is Bereshit for us as a community because we are launching this new creation out into the world and we're looking forward to seeing where it's going to go and what's going to happen to it. So I felt like it was appropriate to give a little bit of a plug for Darshan Yeshiva and to do something really special. I'm going to show you three videos. Um, Actually, excuse me, two videos about Darshan Yeshiva. The first is a little, what we call, explainer video. Talks a little bit about the program. And then the second is actually a video from the program. So one of the things that you learn is Torah. You learn every Parsha. And eventually you learn the entire Bible. The entire Hebrew Bible. And this is the Bereshit course or the Bereshit video within the broader Darshan Yeshiva. So you're actually going to get a sneak peek of one of the videos that's in the program. Everything is self-paced, everything is online, and this is one, one part of it. It's actually Rachel Esther's video that she made for Parsha Bereshit. So we're going to kick off with the explainer video, and then I'm going to cue you in to this sneak peek of the Darshan Yeshiva with Rachel Esther's video on Parsha Bereshit. Sheet. You've always wanted to serve the Jewish community as a rabbi. Fantastic. But there's a problem. You don't have the time or the financial resources to attend rabbinical school. What if there was a way to learn everything you needed to know to be a Jewish leader online and at your convenience? Well, now there is. Introducing the Darshan Yeshiva, an online school training lay Jewish spiritual leaders to serve as Darshanim or para-rabbis in their local communities. At the Darshan Yeshiva, you'll gain all the academic knowledge, ritual leadership, and professional skills to lead a Jewish community. And when you're finished studying with us, you'll be ordained as a Darshan, a Jewish teacher, orator, and community organizer. The Darshan Yeshiva uses the latest in streaming video and audio to deliver relevant classes via your Mac or PC. The Darshan Yeshiva is proud to be flexible, allowing you to study anytime at your own pace, affordable with only one flat monthly rate, and committed to your success through our supportive peer and mentor network. So log on to the Darshan Yeshiva and start your Jewish journey with us today. Shalom. 
This video will give you an overview of Parshat Bereshit. Parshat Bereshit is the first Parshat in the Torah. The text of this Parshat is Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 through chapter 6 verse 8. We begin reading. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The very first word Bereshit means in the beginning and is the very first word of the Torah. This Pasha can be broken into the following segments. Creation, Garden of Eden, Fall of Man, Cain and Abel, Generations of Adam, and the Righteous Noah. We begin with a glance into the creation of everything from nothing by God. This creation includes not only the physical objects around us, but also the spiritual dimensions of the Sabbath. After man is created, God places him in the Garden of Eden a place where all of man's physical and spiritual needs are met. Unfortunately, man and woman choose to disobey God's command to not eat of the tree, and as a result, man and woman were cursed and removed from the garden. Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. One day, Abel decided to bring an offering to God, and Cain followed suit. God accepted Abel's offering, but did not accept Cain's offering. Cain became enraged at Abel and killed him. As a result, God punished Cain to be a wanderer upon the earth. Even with the curse, Cain married and had a son and grandsons. Adam and Eve also had another son, Seth, from whom Noah descended. The generation of Adam's descendants are described. One interesting note is that of Enoch, Seth's grandson, who walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Among the descendants listed are Methuselah, who lived to be 969 years old, and Noah, who was considered a righteous man. The list ends with the birth of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, from whom all humanity is descended. During Noah's time, the Nephilim took the daughters of man who bore children to them. The wickedness of Noah's time bereaved God. God declared that he would blot out all of humanity and the rest of creation, but Noah found favor in his eyes. So ends Parshat Bereshi. Shalom. So just a quick, you know, overview of one of the many pieces of content that's available on Darshan Yeshiva, and this particularly lining up with the Torah portion Bereshit. So if you have any questions about the program, let me know, uh, and I would be more than happy to answer them for you here in the chat room today or in the future. Now, I wanted to do one other thing. I wanted to provide uh, a little bit of light entertainment to go along with uh, Bray Sheet. I kind of feel like, um, although I love the academia that Rachel brings, I'm a little bit of a goofy, silly guy, and I, I'm kind of just into, you know, really using the Bible and humor together. So I found this old video from Punk Torah's archives, and I highly recommend going on YouTube and just Googling Punk, or <laughs> Googling, we use it like a verb now, Googling Punk Torah on YouTube or YouTubing, I guess. I don't know what the right word. Searching. Um, and just go through the rabbit hole. Just look at all the old videos that we have. I think we have something like 600 videos now, something like that. I, I truly lost count a long time ago. Um, but this is one of them. Um, and this was actually a video series we started. It wasn't terribly popular, but I'm really proud of this one particular video. So this is Torah Video Mashup, uh, and this is the video for Bray Sheet that goes along with Torah Video Mashup. Welcome to Torah Video Mashup, where we bring the weekly Torah portion as told to you by your favorite YouTube videos that you're too embarrassed to admit you watch instead of working your crummy office job. Now, are you going to go ahead and have those TPS reports for us? This week's Torah portion is Bereshit, the first book of Genesis. <laughs> Not that book of Genesis, You're getting all confused. Uh, this tells the story of the creation of the earth, of uh, Adam and Eve. We also hear about a snake guy, we've got Cain and Abel, and then we've got this whole story with monsters and angels and a whole bunch of other stuff that they didn't teach you in Bible study. So in the opening of our Torah reading Bray Sheet, God creates the world in six days and rests on the seventh. Kind of works like this. First we have the darkness and the light, and then on the second day God forms the heavens, dividing the upper waters from the lower waters. 
And then on the third day, God sets the boundaries of the land and sea, and it's all whoosh, that kind of stuff. And uh, then we get some trees and some shrubbery. Now, on the fourth day, God puts the sun and the moon and the stars all in their place. We got some little fishies and some reptiles and creatures like that on the fifth day. And then we get land animals and a human being by the name of Adam on the sixth day. On the seventh day, God decides to take a vacation, which is where we get Shabbat. Now, of course, if you're Dawkins, you think that this whole thing is freaking silly, and I can understand that completely. But let's take a look at the words we have here. So we have Adam which is the one on the right here. And then we have Adama. Adama is the word for ground. Pretty similar, right? Adam, the little X thing, the hook thing, and the M thing, comes from Adama, Earth, or the X thing that has the little H-looking thing at the end. What's interesting is that the little hook circle thing, that's Dom, means blood. So basically, we have two words here. We have Adam, which is sort of like blood person, and Adama. Now, Ma means how. So Adama, if you look at how all of the words come together, basically means how the blood person got here. Pretty cool, huh? All right, let's move on. Living in paradise was just so stressful today, but you always know just what to do. I know we were just created, but I feel like we've known each other forever, you know, like all seven days. I know, I'm just so comfortable around you. What are you doing? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you just said oh. I... Uh-uh. <laughs> uh-oh. Uh, this Ugh. is all my fault. Listen, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's fine. It's just... It seemed like God wanted us to start the human race, so I was thinking that I'd do what God wanted. I know. So. I'm sorry. If you think I led you on, I, I just don't see us like that. So, Genesis 1... No more Genesis jokes! tells the story of the creation of the world and the people in it, the collective Adam. But Genesis 2 tells the story of a dude named Adam and his wife Eve. Yeah, the Adam thing is confusing, but if you wanted to watch something simple, you should just watch the Numa Numa video over and over again. Now, moving on, we have this whole snake issue. Now, snake cults were a common thing back in the ancient Near East, so when the Torah calls the snake the most cunning creature, it's not because the snake itself was that smart, but because snake cults, which ran in opposition to the Hebrews' monotheism, were a real threat. The snake is made out to be the bad guy in the story because, well, snake cults were a bad thing. Plus, who really thinks that snakes are all that smart? If I was going to start a cult, I'd start the cult of the honey badger. Here comes a fierce battle between a king cobra and a honey badger. I wonder what'll happen. Look at this, there's the honey badger just eating a mouse. And then look, get away from me, says the snake, get away from me. Honey badger don't care. Adam and Eve eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Basically, they wanted to be as smart as God, as well as immortal. Now, God's not a huge fan of this sort of thing, and Adam and Eve are banished from the garden. I know, I know, really sad. But hey, it gets better, right? Because Adam and Eve have two sons, huh? Wrong. Watch what happens to Cain and Abel. So, brother, God values you above me. We shall see how he values you in death. Now, most people think this is the end of the story, but it's not. The next thing that happens is a whole bunch of begatting, and that's basically Bible talk for making babies. And then there's this weird story that's completely up for interpretation. Basically, it says that a whole group of people called the Sons of Heaven were taking brides, and that their children were giants called Nephilim. Now, mainstream Judaism doesn't take these sons to actually be angels or Joss Whedon for that matter, but it's up to interpretation. What's not up for debate is that these were horrible people, so God decides to wipe out everyone from the earth just like a big ol' Etch-a-Sketch. I hear raindrops, and that means it's time for Parsha Noah. Stay tuned as we tread water. a punk tour 
Power Production. Thank you for watching. One of my favorite videos of all time. I, I love those videos. I wish we still made them, but it's it's a really labor-intensive process to make those videos. Um, and unfortunately, we just don't kind of have that, that much time around here. Maybe one day, maybe one day we'll have enough free time that we can do that. So we're going to move seriously now into our schma. This is one of uh, my favorite videos. I guess they're all my favorite videos because I'm the one that picked them. <laughs> but uh, this schma is absolutely beautiful. Um, it was actually done by a young woman for her synagogue youth group. Um, and it's been a favorite. I've, I've shown it, I think, two or three times. And it's been a favorite here, so I wanted to do it again. Make way now for our schma. tell you that he loves me I won't tell you that he saved my life but I can say as loud and clear as I can sing from my lips to your is that this one of our God in every one of our lives And that's why we sing Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Oh, and that's why we sing Shema
it's absolutely beautiful to me what creative people can do. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's overwhelming sometimes. I, I love creative people. And hey, I wanted to mention, next week when we do our Shabbat service, I'd like to try something um, a little bit different. You know, I show these videos, and this is kind of my style. Uh, Adi, who does the evening service, has a little bit of a different style than I do, and Katsira has a different style than I do. We all kind of have our different things, and I think we each bring something unique uh, to the Shabbat experience. I'd like to give you the opportunity to bring something unique to the Shabbat experience. So all of these videos that I've been showing you, with the exception of the ones that we created, um, are all videos from YouTube. So what I want to encourage you to do is to send me an email, patrick at punktora.org. Send me your favorite Jewish YouTube videos. Now, a few things to remember so that you'll be able to send the right kinds of videos. Number one, next week's Torah portion is Noah. Noah. So if you find any videos that are related to that week's Torah portion, that would be great. Not that I don't want to see other videos about other Torah portions, but really we want to focus on what uh, we're going to do next week. So anything about Noah, Noah's Ark, anything related to that would be fantastic. Additionally, we have a Shabbat service that includes two parts. The Kabbalat Shabbat, those are the songs that lead up to Mariv, which is where we have Baruch Hu and Shema and Viahavta and all of these other songs. So find any kind of videos related to the Shabbat service, and we'll play those as well. And what we'll do is we'll essentially crowdsource the Shabbat service. Um, so send me your favorite Shema, send me your favorite Lecha Dodi, send me your favorite Shiru Ladonai, or Or Zarua, or Romemu, or uh, Vishamru, or, or whatever the case may be. Send videos about Noah. Um, Michael asked the question, B'nai Noach. Um, you can send something about B'nai Noach, sure. Um, so send anything that's going to be relevant to the Shabbat service. And if you're not sure if it's relevant to the Shabbat service, send it anyway. One of the things that I try really hard to do, and it's, it's very hard to convince people of this, is that you can't screw up. You aren't unqualified, right? I mean, you could tell me right now that you are not Jewish, you're going to convert 20 years from now, and I would still say, great, I don't care, send me your favorite Jewish YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's we're a participatory community. We can only be a community if you participate, right? Now, why is that? I tell you, it'd be a heck of a lot easier if this were like television, where it was not interactive, where you just sat there and just sort of zoned out on a, on a, on a screen, and that was the end of it. If I wasn't saying, you know, hello to Jenny and Sarah and Carl and Lisa and Hannah and Michael and my mother, who's hiding out as one of the secret viewers, um, you know, it would be a lot easier. It wouldn't take nearly as much effort, but it also wouldn't be as much fun. We wouldn't be a community together. So I would encourage you to please get active. Even if it's something like sending a link to a YouTube video, get active, get involved. This community exists because of you. Now, one of the things that I think is really interesting, moving into the rest of our service, is the constant repetition of the names of the matriarchs and the patriarchs. And I think it's fascinating that we do that, you know, that we intone the names of these people who have had these experiences that we read about in our Torah. Now, why do we do that? The best explanation I've ever heard is that their journey is ours. I'll say that one more time. Their journey is ours. I think that human beings have two landscapes. So we have the external landscape. You know, we have where we live. We have the things that we do in our day. You know, we have our, our house, our apartment, whatever. We have our job. We have our city. We have all these things that are external to us. And we are people in that external environment, in that landscape. But when we turn inward, we recognize something that the mystics have always recognized, which is that we have an internal landscape. We have an internal journey. We have things about ourselves that we walk through. You think about 
daydreaming and how easy it is for human beings to daydream and to daydream about very literal things. You think about how we feel like we're conquering things, that we're jumping through hoops, that we're jumping over um, huge obstacles that are in our way. We have this sense that there is an internal landscape, as Sarah just mentioned. And I think that spirituality is what happens when the internal experience and the external experience bump against each other, when they collide with one another when the internal demons that we're fighting show up as external demons, when the joys, when our internal joys show up as externalities, as external joys. We have these things that are outside of us that connect to the things that are inside of us. We have these inside things that connect to things that are on the outside. I think that's where spirituality comes from. And I think that's why in the Jewish tradition, we've placed such an emphasis on the matriarchs and patriarchs because they had a journey, and that's what we read in the Torah. We read about their journey, and their journey is our journey because fundamentally, human beings are the same. We're made of all the same stuff. A human being today is the same as a human being a thousand years ago. It's all the same stuff. Same as a human being 5,000 years ago, same as a human being 10,000 years ago. Very, very few variations when you go back. And so I enjoy that part of the Torah. I enjoy the fact that we get to have this journey with them. And let me tell you, the best journey you can have is a journey with someone that you love. That is the best kind of journey you can have. You can go on the greatest vacation in the world, but if you go with people you don't like, you're not going to have any fun. And similarly, you can go on the most boring vacation in the world. It's the most boring place, but if you're with someone you care about, it's paradise. So I would encourage you to read the Torah and to read it as your journey. And in that spirit, I'd like to play one of my favorite videos, uh, she is not considered a matriarch in our Amidah, uh, but I think that we can include her in a certain way. This is the prophetess Miriam, and this is Miriam's song. One which sang our history With every thread and every strand She crafted her delight A woman touched with spirit She danced the stars alive Just as she had 
Miriam's song. Uh, absolutely wonderful song. I actually, you know, I have a confession to make. I didn't like that song when I first heard it, and the only reason... Um, uh, the only reason I didn't like that song is because it reminds me of the same cadence as a song from South Park. So I used to make fun of my fiancé about, oh, Miriam's song, whatever, that's the Brian Boitano song from South Park. Uh, but it's a great song, and I play it all the time. Um, we're going to move now into our healing aspect of our Shabbat service. This is the Misha Beirach. Um, I want to give everyone an opportunity to understand that healing is not only about other people. So I, I make this comment every now and then. What is the most dangerous? Uh, what is the most dangerous phrase that you can utter? I'd be curious to know what do you think um, is the most dangerous thing you can say. I'll give you a few examples. Um, a dangerous thing to say might be like uh, yelling fire in a crowded uh, theater, right? <laughs> like that would be a very dangerous thing to say. Does anyone have, have another sense? I mean, we can just have fun with it. Like, what would be a dangerous thing? Uh, Hannah says, I hate you. That would, that would be a terrible thing, da dangerous thing to say. Uh, <laughs> Jenny comes from the um, uh, uh, optimistic school <laughs> by saying, quote, nothing worse can possibly happen. Right, that's a very dangerous thing uh, to say. Absolutely. Anything else? Does anyone have a sense of what, what's like the most dangerous thing you can say? What's the most provocative uh, thing? So Sarah actually kind of gets close on this with, I don't need anything. Right. Okay, you're close, so I'm going to go on ahead and reveal, a big reveal, what I think the most dangerous phrase in the world is. It's three words. I need help. I think that's the most dangerous phrase in the world. I need help. And here's why I think it's dangerous. I think that it evokes really two feelings in people. One is, well, what's your problem? You need help? Well, what do you need help for? So there's that pushback. And I think the second thing that makes it dangerous is the fact that if you say, I need help, you are saying, in a sense, that you are helpless. And I think particularly, I'm coming from the perspective of an American, um, I think that we have a narrative about bootstrapping and being a little island, the sovereign self, the person who you know can do it all on your own. And that's a big part of our narrative. Um, and it's successful to a certain degree. Um, but then what happens when you can't do it all by yourself, when your little island doesn't work anymore? Um, that's when the phrase, I need help, becomes, I think, very dangerous. It knocks us out of the complacency that comes from believing that we can do anything. And it knocks us out of the complacency that everyone else can do anything. And so we don't have to get involved with them. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent, and I hope you'll follow me. I frequently hear people talking about tikkun olam. And this idea of tikkun olam is repairing the world, or heal healing the world, or being God's partner in the world. And when I hear people talk about tikkun olam, perhaps it's a result of what I do for a living, working in the Jewish community. I usually hear about it in the context of writing a check. You know, tikkun olam, we need to repair the world. Please support this organization. Tikkun olam, we need to be God's partner in creation. So please give to this organization or to this person in this faraway country. I'm not going to knock that at all. We do that here at One Shul. You know, we, we have to fundraise. We have to support ourselves in order to be a living community. But here's what worries me. What happens when we start outsourcing our tikkun olam? 
What happens when we think that there is someone else out there who can do tikkun olam better, that we, better than we can? And what happens when we think that tikkun olam is not something that we do, it is something we empower others to do? And that's a terrific thing. But I'll give you an example. About two years ago, someone that I barely knew, his fa- but, it was, but he lives here in Atlanta where I live, his father passed away. And uh, a mutual friend of ours calls me on the phone and he says, we need to go to a Shiva minion um, that's being held. And I know you don't know uh, this guy very well, but uh, his father's passed away. We're trying to put this together. Um, would you please come? And I said, of course. So, uh, myself and my girlfriend at the time, now fiancé, went to the Shiva Minion. We knew a couple of people. We didn't really know the mourners um, very well, but we kind of sat there with the the son and with his mother. He's an older, older guy. Um, And uh, one of the things that struck me was we had about, I think, eight, eight people, and it was a traditional, the, the son um, who was mourning the loss of his father is very traditional um, with the idea that you had to have ten people for a minion. So what we did, or what they did while we sat there with him, was go through the apartment complex that he lived in and knock on all of the doors of people who had mezuzot, the little... Um, box on the door that has the the scroll inside it. It's a way of knowing that a Jewish person lives there. So we were going through, or they were going through the apartment complex knocking on these doors and trying to find Jewish people who would be willing to come just to say Kaddish, right? Very short thing. Takes two minutes of your time. It was interesting when I was sitting there. We eventually got to 10. I think then we got to 12. And then two ladies came in. Two older ladies, probably 70s, 80s. And we were about to get started, and but we we were just trying to sort out the books, you know, Sidurium and who was going to lead and and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, the lady said, oh, do you have 10 people? And the mourner said, yeah, we, we have, I think, 11 or 12. And the old lady said, oh, okay, well, then you don't need us. We're missing our programs. And they turned around and left. And, okay, I get it. They didn't know that person. They didn't know that family. But someone is mourning. And, you know, Jews, we believe in showing up. That's what we do. We show up to things. Someone's in trouble. Someone's sick. Someone's died. You show up. It's what you do. That is a a Jewish value, showing up. Hine ni. As the Bible says, here I am, being present and accounted for. But they thought to themselves, you know what, I'm missing my programs. Someone else is there. Someone else can do it for me. I don't want to live in a world where we think we are too busy, where we think we are too broke, where we think that we are too unqualified to help other people. I do not want to live in that world. And I want to do everything that I can to change that. Because it comes down to those three dangerous words. I need help. We need to become a culture where not only are we able to say, I need help, but where we are overwhelmed by the desire to help others and not in a passive way in a very aggressive and a very hands-on, getting-your-hands-dirty kind of way. We have to do that. We have a moral responsibility to do that. That's what tikkun olam is. Tikkun olam is not passing the buck. Tikkun olam is not setting up systems so that other people can receive. It's about one-on-one, right? It's about your next-door neighbor is losing their house, we help pay the mortgage. It's about the neighbor kid down the street loses his parent, you babysit for that family. It's that kind of stuff. That's what we've got to do. I live in an apartment complex where I don't know a single neighbor, and that worries me. I have how who knows how many Facebook friends, but I have no idea at any given time what's happening to anybody. 
I know their cat YouTube cat videos, and I know um, you know what they had for breakfast, but I don't know if they've lost a parent or if they've lost a job. And I want to get away from being in a world where other people are not important. So I'd like to start that today. So I'd like to offer up Misha Berach for everyone who is in need of healing of mind, body, and spirit. I'd like to include my brother, who is having some heart trouble. He's going into surgery. Um, I'd like to include my mother, who um, just had some trouble with her lip. Um, we hope that she's going to be okay. Um, I'd like to include my uh, fiancé's kitty cat, who uh, is very sick. We need to try to help her out. Um, and I'd like to offer up myself as well. I um, recently found out that I have an eye problem, and uh, that has led to me having to get lots of blood work and all sorts of other things. Hopefully I'll be okay. Doctors seem to think everything will be all right, um, but I'd like to offer that up as well. Because guess what? I'm the rabbi, but I need help. Misha Berach, please include the names of anyone in your life who needs help. Move on now to our Mourner's Kaddish. I'll include a link here in the chat room. Mourner's Kaddish is sometimes called the Orphan's Benediction. It depends on which Siddur you're looking at. But what this Kaddish is about is it's about describing, it's actually not about death at all, it's about describing perfection. And it makes a really great comment. It says, La'ela min kol birkata vishirata. You know, blessings, words, uh, or, uh, words beyond all words. Blessings and song. Beyond any blessing and song. What is being described is the perfection of the world, and the perfection of heaven, and the perfection of being cleaved totally to God. It's a mystical experience. What's interesting is this idea of li ela min kol bir chata vishirata, beyond all blessings and song. And yet, we're saying a blessing. We're saying a song. There's a beautiful futility to that. That even though we know consciously, we have the written word in front of us, that we are describing something that is beyond description. We are still going to describe it. And I think that that speaks to the uniqueness of the human spirit and the fact that even when we know something is not necessary, even when we know something is not possible, we are still compelled to do it because that's the way we are built. 
and that's where all of the beautiful things in the world, art, poetry, the love between people, the love between a mother and a child, a father and a child, all of these things that we know are sometimes futile, and yet we do them anyway. And yet we say them anyway. That's what Kaddish is about. Because it's the knowledge that it's not quite right. You know? That it's not quite enough. That we can never quite approximate perfection. We can never quite get there. We can't even quite describe it. But we're going to do it anyway, darn it. Because that's what it means to be a person. And that going back to the idea of journey... That's the journey that we're on, this constant striving, even if it's just to describe the beauty of heaven. Please include, if you are in the Shloshim period, or if you are observing a yard site, the name of the person that you would like to include. Uh, we also include uh, in our Kaddish the names of anyone who does not have a living relative uh, to say Kaddish for them. Yit gadav yit kadashime raba, beama di ra hirute, beam leek mahute, bahaye hon u yome hon u haye de kol bit Yisrael, bagalab is man kuriv, beam ru amen. Yehe raba me vorak le alam o male maya. Git barak viishtabak, fit par vitramam vietnase, via tadar via tale via talal, shmeda kudisha brehu. La ila min kol birchata bishirata, tush bechata venechamata, damiram be alma bimru amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shamaya, the chayim. Alenu be al koyisrael, bimru amen. Ose shalom bimramav, huya ose shalom. Alenu be al koyisrael, bimru amen. May the one who makes peace and the heights, may you also make peace upon us, upon all Israel and upon the entire world, and say, Amen. Thank you very much for attending this online service. We have another one going on at 8 o'clock, so four hours from now, uh, 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. It's around the Shabbat table with Adi. Um, his uh, is going to be a brief Shabbat observance or a service, and it's followed by a discussion. The discussion is the key to this. This is why you go to this particular online service. Uh, it's themed, and it's themed, Don't Panic, A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Torah. And Adi is a terrific guy. He does a really cool class, so I highly, uh, or a really cool chat, I should say. I highly recommend you come. Uh, Hana, who's actually with us uh, in the chat room right now, is going to be doing a Torah talk on Monday. We had a, a few technical difficulties, um, but Hana and I have sort of straightened them out. Hopefully everything will work out okay. That's this Monday, uh, 8 p.m., we also have a new series that's starting. It's our midweek Mariv with Tracy. You may remember Tracy um, was a leader about a year ago. She had to take some time off, do some other things, but now she's back with us and we're just thrilled to have her. So she's going to start leading this midweek service. It's about an hour long. It's a chance to learn the Shema, to learn the Amidah, uh, and I'm really pumped to see how that's going to turn out. Uh, and then, of course, we have next Friday, we have our early Shabbat service. Um, I'm probably going to do that one around 5 o'clock. Um, but then after that, at 7, we'll have Ketzira's Shabbat and Rosh Chodesh service. If you're into Kohenet, feminist spirituality, Jewish renewal, um, mysticism, song, lots of singing, lots of chanting, uh, I highly recommend going to Ketzira's Shabbat service next week. As I said before, we are an online Jewish community. We're also a nonprofit, and we really require your donations in order to exist. It costs about one hundred and fifty dollars to run the chat or to run the uh, video stream. It costs about twenty dollars a month to have the chat room, and then of course we have all of the other costs of building the website, maintaining it, and operating it. We can't do it without your help. There is no person high in the sky who's throwing money down. It's your help. It's your donations that make it happen. If we don't have your donations, things go away. So please be supportive. You can donate with the top right-hand button. Additionally, you can also volunteer your time, right? So Hannah volunteers her time. Tracy volunteers her time. Um, 
We have lots of ways you can volunteer your time. So you can send an email to patrick at punctora.org and we'll set you up. No experience preferred. No experience preferred. So thank you again so much, and we'll see you uh, later tonight for Audis Around the Shabbat Table. Take care. Shabbat Shalom.